Now welcome in former big leaguer Braves analyst at Fox Sports South and Fox Sports Southeast and of course a holder of a 0.00 career ERA, Nick Green. Nick, as always, good to see you, my man. Yeah, it's good to see you too, man. I'm glad we could talk today. Absolutely. Now, a lot to get into, but I want to start out with the MLB draft. In any normal year, I mean, there would have been a third day, which we would have been today. Uh, you were a 32nd round pick yourself by the Braves out of Georgia Perimeter College and 971st overall pick. So many players didn't get that moment, though, with this being a scaled down draft. Interested your thoughts, uh, certainly an unprecedented situation, but that one thing being taken away, that life changing moment for these players. Well, it's tough. And it's it, knowing that I was a 32nd rounder probably wasn't supposed to make it. Um, there are a lot of kids that were, would be in my shoes right now. How do you even get the opportunity anymore? And that's the disappointing part about all this. I think there's still going to be opportunity for uh, players to sign and get that opportunity somewhere along the line. But you, it's so important as a late round draft pick or somebody who's um, not highly touted to get an opportunity as quick as they can. So for instance, I played junior college my sophomore year, I sign, I make an impression right off the bat in short season. And that's what these kids need to be able to do. So I didn't have a long leash. If I, if I didn't perform all well that first year, I was out. So what happens is if I don't get to play this entire season, which the minor league season is more than likely over with, um, even if these kids do sign because they want the opportunity, you don't have that chance this year to show what you can do. Now you go into spring training, you don't play well, and they never get the opportunity. Um, so it, it's difficult for me to watch, to see, just knowing that a lot of people aren't going to be able to fulfill their dreams. Yeah, certainly post-draft teams, the ability to sign undrafted players for $20,000. Basically, I mean, this turns into recruiting all over again. It's like college, you know, it's like teams leveraging, trying to, to find the best situation for these kids. But if you were a player in this environment and you talked about, you know, the, the emphasis on making a quick impression. I mean, think about high schoolers who, who weren't drafted or one of the college players who are, you know, are with more eligibility. How do you weigh a difficult decision of getting that chance to play pro ball or gambling on yourself in a future draft? I think that you have to go back to school. I mean, there's no, no reason to sign and, and hope you play well next year. You, you're losing a year of development. And to me, it's so crucial to get out there, get your feet wet, and play. And if you're not going to get that opportunity, you have a chance to go to college or you have a chance to, to uh, do other things, but you're playing, you play summer ball or whatever, when they, if they do have something uh, of that nature, that's the important part. If you don't play, you're not going to get better. And that's a fact. So uh, I think that you have to weigh the opportunity. Yes, everybody wants to sign and play pro ball, but what's your ultimate goal? Is it just to play pro ball or is it to get to the big leagues? And if it's to get to the big leagues, I feel like you've got to keep playing you have to keep developing. And if you basically sit out for an entire year, that development is not where it needs to be. And you aren't sped up to the, pro the, the proper speed that you need to be to get to the big leagues. So you have to weigh what you, what you really want to do. Is it just about signing or is it making it to the big leagues? Now, what do you remember about your own draft experience? I mean, who called you? At what point did you know that the Braves were interested? What, what, what kind of memories do you have from that time period? So, so mine's interesting because it was a draft to follow. Uh, they don't have that anymore. So, Basically, I played my freshman year, got drafted, didn't expect to get drafted at all, didn't really understand the process, um, was just enjoying playing with my teammates and trying to win a JUCO championship. So I get drafted. They immediately tell me I'm not going to sign, um, so, which I kind of expected anyway. And then the following year, I signed before the draft. So mine is a little bit different, but it felt good to know that a team had me under control for a year. They wanted me. Um, they viewed me highly. Uh, they expected me to be a fourth to eighth rounder my sophomore year. So going in, into my sophomore year, knowing that I was under control by the Braves hometown team, uh, it was pretty special. But the moment I actually signed the contract and left and went to Jamestown, New York, uh, it felt pretty good. But at the same time, I just, this is what I did. And I thought I was going to do it the rest of my life. I just enjoyed playing the game. So it was just another step in the direction of just playing the game, having fun and enjoying it. Nick, ahead of Wednesday's first round of the draft, Commissioner Rob Manford said, we are going to play baseball in 2020 100%. Uh, the owners are preparing a counteroffer uh, for the 86-game season, full prorated pay, and maybe the last best offer considering Manford has that uh, option to declare a start to a 50-game season. A report came out that owners have heard from several players that they would sit out if Manford uh, does so, forfeiting salary, forfeiting service time. 
from your perspective, how much damage is done to the sport if Manfred has to step in uh, and bring us an end to the squabbling between owners and players? Uh, I, I think a lot of damage is going to be done. And I think damage is already done, unfortunately, because of how public the negotiations are. This, this is a pandemic where it's not about the CBA and the owners are, are making it about the CBA. Uh, I don't know all the details and that's, it's hard for me to say because they're saying the language and the, the uh, negotiations that they agreed to or the agreement they agreed to earlier in March says that they can go back and Manfred can implement whatever season he wants, however long he wants it. So how do you go back on that? I don't know, because I don't know the, the terminology and what was in the, in the agreement, but it's unfortunate because now it's out in public and everybody looks bad. And I think the owners are trying to make the players look bad. I think the players are trying to make the owners look bad. And to me, that could have long lasting impact on how people view the players, how they view the game. Um, I, I know they're going to play. I hope that they agree to something without Manfred having to step in because if he does step in, uh, I, I just don't think it's going to be pretty. And um, I, I want to think everybody's good guys and good guys on both sides can come together, but it just doesn't seem like that's really happening right now. Yeah. I can't forget too, the, the current CBA expires in 2021. So this doesn't necessarily bode well for the sides coming <laughs> to an agreement uh, when there's actually, you know, like a long standing uh, proposition uh, on the table between the two of them. Now around the country, youth baseball is back here at Lake Point Sports. We already have a number of uh, events, multiple uh, events, dozens of teams uh, in play. Certainly there are safety guidelines in place. MLB though is a bit of a different animal. Uh, there's likely no major minor league season. Uh, setting in stands and, and getting into games. Uh, there's lots of uh, interesting little protocols that are going to be potentially in place. For a guy who was a reserve like yourself, I mean, the national Sean Doolittle has voiced his concern about proposed health guidelines. But from a guy who was from your perspective, uh, when you have to get into a game, I mean, if you think about the possibility of, of being in the stands and having to get yourself ready, what, what are we not thinking about in terms of the health concerns or and, potential of injury. I mean, certainly everyone's concerned about the virus and the spread of a virus, but how much are we not thinking about those other variables in terms of a player's health? Well, I think that if you want the, the product on the field to be as great of a product as you need it to be for the fans and for baseball, then you're going to have to uh, adjust those guidelines a little bit. Having players in the stands, reserves, what are you going to do? You're going to put your cleats on and, and run around up, run stadiums, you know what I'm saying? So, how do you get ready for that? How, if you can't take BP in the cage with somebody throwing to you, how do you get ready? Because for me, as a reserve player, it would maybe the third inning, I would go in and hit some balls off the tee. Then I would go in a little bit later, have somebody flip to me uh, just to make sure that I'm constantly ready. Because if I'm sitting, say I'm sitting in the stands watching a game, and then all of a sudden the seventh inning, they need me to double switch. How do I get loose? And that's, that's one of the questions that I have as a reserve player if you can't get loose, you're not keeping your body moving um, and you're not ready to perform when they ask you to perform, you're going to get hurt. So it's, it's going to be interesting because I think some of that stuff's going to have to move a little bit. They're going to have to relax the guidelines. And, and I get why they have them. They have them because we're in a crisis and we don't want other people to get uh, sick. But at the same time, you've got to take some risk there uh, in order for the product on the field to be as, as great of a product as it should be. And I wonder, Timmy, if there's no minor leagues, how does a guy rehab? You know, if somebody's coming back from injury, what, what, what do they even do? Do they have, I mean, is there simulated games? And there's just certain aspects that we just don't, aren't thinking about in terms of just trying to figure out the baseline of let's get players back in the field. And there's a reality. It's the players that are risking their health. They're putting their family's health at risk. So let me ask you this. From those you've talked to around the game, do guys think it's worth coming back if, if those risks are all out there? I think some do and some don't. Um, you got to look at, what, what they're, what's going on in their lives? Some guys are having kids. Uh, is it worth it to risk the, the health of your pregnant wife, the health of your little kid? Um, and if you have enough money, then you can say, no, I, I don't think that uh, it's worth it. And that's something that they have to decide. But when you look at the, the younger players, the guys uh, without families, I think they're willing to take that risk to go out there and play. And uh, again, I think that the majority of the players really want to play for the fans. They want to get back. Uh, to some sort of normalcy with baseball. We need baseball. The country needs baseball. And I think uh, the majority of the players are, are more than willing to take that risk. Yeah, certainly Manfred has promised baseball. Certainly the hope that both sides have come to an agreement. And give us a scene that's a little bit more meaningful in length uh, than some of these proposals that have been pushed out there. I mentioned your pitching line in the intro uh, for taking them out of one game against the Red Sox, uh, for the Red Sox in 2009 against the White Sox. 
By the way, went up against future Hall of Famer Jim Tomey, no less. But I want to dial it back <laughs> even further than that. From your days at Atlanta's Duluth High School, a program that also, of course, gave us Brian McCann, you still have a slew of records there, by the way. Home runs, batting average hits. I want to know, what's the moment that you feel like defined Nick Green as a player before he ever put on a major league uniform? I think that I, I had to jump to college and just understanding that I had the ability to, to possibly make it to the big leagues. Um, I think that my sophomore year really defined me as a player. Uh, I was a, I was on a team with, with Marlon Bird, who was a 10-year big leaguer. Um, he was a really good player. We had some other good players who went on to college. But at that time, I thought that I was good, but I didn't realize how good I was um, and didn't realize that I had the chance to make it to the big leagues. So I think the defining moment was just during that year, my sophomore year in college. And the other thing too, that I think that helped me along the way, and I think a lot of people forget is I just wanted to play every game because I enjoyed the game. I wanted to win every game. And a lot of times now that's not what it's about. So it's just about making money, getting a paycheck, becoming famous. Um, and you lose perspective on why you're playing the game. And I think that that helped me more than anything, uh, just the perspective of not worrying about, am I going to be at the next level? Uh, in a month? Am I going to be in double A next year? Just taking it one game at a time. And and that was, to me, really the the perspective that I took to get to where I was. But I go back to that sophomore year of college, and that really just defined me as a player. Yeah, I think we'd all love to go back to college. Give him a follow <laughs> at Nick Green 20 And whenever baseball gets started again, you'll be able to see him on Braves Live on Fox Sports Southeast and Fox Sports South. Nick, a pleasure as always. Always. Thank you, man.